All right. Well, good morning, everybody. If you could, I'll stand on my tippy toes. I'm a little on the short side. My name's Eric Farmer. I'm the director of operations here. Uh, glad you're here this morning. We've uh, got one more message today in our road trip series that Pastor Corey is going to bring to us. Um, if you would stand, and uh, we're going to pray, and then we've got uh, a few worship songs to usher in God's presence. So, Heavenly Father, uh, we stand uh, with expectancy that you're going to do something awesome this morning. Lord, quiet our minds, open our hearts, and uh, just do what you would want to do here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we welcome you here today. Do you hear our praise as we celebrate you, as we worship you? Come have your way. It's the song of the redeemed rising from the African plains. It's the song of the forgiven, drowning out the Amazon rain. The song of Asian believers, filled with God's holy fire. It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation, a love song born of a grateful choir. We say, it's all God's children singing alone. It's all God's children sing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Let it rise, yeah, let it rise above the formings, caught up in the heavenly sound. The praises that go from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. From the songs and from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells run from a thousand steeples, none reach truer than this, than this, than this. It's all got to sing the glory, glory. It's all got children sing the love and glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children sing the love and glory. Hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all got children sing. Tremble at what they just heard. Because all the powers of darkness can drown out a single word. Let's lift up our praise. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they just heard. Because all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. It's all got to be seen. Sing the love and go. 
Filho do ar.
just saving us and calling us home, for calling us sons, for calling us daughters, for giving us a new name, for giving us a new purpose. So Lord, come and have your way. Speak to us. glad you guys came to hang out with us this weekend. Go ahead and say hello to somebody next to you today. Find a seat. Ask them, what service are they coming to? Are they coming Saturday night? Are they coming early? Find them. And everywhere I go, I feel your arms and me surrounding. I need to let you know, I'm never letting go. When I see you moving, I'm moving. You're giving me Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So good to see you all's faces. Um, my name is Goldine, and I help out with the youth over here. My name's Eric. You guys saw me down there. Hopefully, I was trying to stand up on my tippy toes so you could see me. Um, we just have a couple of announcements for you guys this morning, just to let you know some things that are up and coming, especially with uh, with Easter on the way. Yeah, first off, though, if you're new, we would love to get to know you. So on your way out, we have a first Sunday banner, and we would love if you can just come to the front desk. We can get some of your information. And then we also have a small gift for you that we would love to give to you. And so on your way out, just go to the front desk, and we would love to get that information. Also, next week is a very special Sunday. It's Easter. And so we're going to celebrate that very special day, and we're going to have four gatherings to kick that off. And so on Saturday, before Sunday, we're going to have a 6 p.m. service. And then on Sunday, we're going to have an 8 a.m. service. We're going to have a 9.30 service and a 11 a.m. service. And so we would love to see you at any one of those services. And then also... For those of us who um, are joining us online, we have two online services, and so we have one on Saturday at 6 p.m. and then one on Sunday at 8 a.m., and we would love to see you there as well. Absolutely. So as you guys can see on the screen, Easter is for everybody, right? So that means invite. Invite your neighbors, invite your coworkers, your family members, your estranged family members, whoever, because Easter is for everybody, right? We want to celebrate the risen Lord. And so what we also want to celebrate is people committing their lives to Jesus, right? So on April 7th, so it's going to be that following Wednesday at 6.30, we're actually going to have a worship and baptism night. So again, how cool would it be if the person you invited to Easter said, you know what, I'm going to take that step, and I'm going to commit my life to the Lord, and I'm going to get baptized. So that's what we're going to be celebrating. Uh, We're going to be doing something called WIFO, which is worship your face off. So it's going to be high energy. We're going to be praising God, celebrating God, and we want you to be part of that, okay? So April 7th, 630. Also, guys, with everything that's going on, we're, we're, we're able to do so much. God has blessed Canyon View, and he's working through each of you. And so what we're talking about, guys, is how we can financially invest in the kingdom, right? And so that's our tithes and our offerings and, and how what you give through your heart Actually, we reach the community, we reach the world, but we're also reaching eternity. And so as you see on the board here, uh, we've got a variety of ways that you can give, whether it's a text, uh, whether it's online, drop off a check, uh, the boxes in the back. We're just trying to make as many avenues as possible so we can continue to watch what God does through Canyon View. So we're going to pray for that offering today. If you would bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we're so grateful that you would choose us, that you would choose us to accomplish your will and your purposes. And so, Father, whatever it is um, that you would call us to give, whether it's of our tithes and our offerings or 
for our time. Lord, we just want to uh, be respectful and obedient to how you're calling and speaking to each of us. So we ask that you would bless this tithe and offering uh, today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, go ahead and uh, turn your attentions to the screens, please. Communion is more than just remembering Jesus' sacrifice. It's an invitation. Communion invites us to a table we'd otherwise never see. It's an invitation to intentional time with God. And intentional time with God leads us to deeper communion with God. Good morning. It's so nice to see you guys. The first thing I want to say is turn to your neighbor and say thank you. And you're probably wondering why. <laughs> um, so, you know, with the rows blocked off and spacing within this kind of as hopefully COVID season's ending, we have our nine o'clock gathering has a lot of folks and it's hard for some people to find some room. And so by you coming to the 11 o'clock, by you sacrificing and sleeping in, <laughs> you are sleeping in for the Lord and uh, keep coming to 11 o'clock. Th this one's way better than the nine o'clock. And so... But I, but I seriously just wanted to thank you guys for being at this one and creating space and so on and so forth. So today we're going to, we're launching, do you guys know what Sunday it is? Uh, churches all around the world and every continent are celebrating a particular Sunday today. Do you know what it is? Palm Sunday. So it's the beginning of what some call Holy Week as we reflect on the passion of Christ and moving up to Easter. And so Palm Sunday, it's this ancient kind of ritual. I don't know if you knew this that you actually take your palm, they started doing it a long time ago, and you hit another palm and you give a high five. That's where you get Palm Sunday. So give a high five to someone. No, it's not that, but that's okay. Uh, it is the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ as he's coming into Jerusalem, fully knowing what's ahead of him, and people are waving palm branches and such, and you get the idea, for those of you who are new here, that that's a Palm Sunday thing. And then now this week is all these very cool things, hard things, suffering things, glorious things that Jesus does in order to show his love for you and for me. So today, what we're going to do is part of the week there was a supper. Right? Part of the week, this week coming up, 2,000 years ago, there was a supper. In fact, there were two suppers. And so these very simple tables uh, represent suppers. This first table over here we'll call table number one. And this is the Last Supper. Everybody say Last Supper. The Last Supper was good. They had a lot of good food. It wasn't just like hot dogs and macaroni. It was like other stuff. And one of the key things we remember about the Last Supper is that it was bread and there was wine. And we're going to talk about So this is the Last Supper table. Okay. Now, over here. Oh, wait. I just lit that. Why did I light that candle? But why do people light a candle? Because Jesus is the light of the world. Right? Okay. Why do you light a candle? Right, good friend of mine who passed recently always said that every time she lit a candle. See, here we have the light of Christ because the world is still dark or has darkness. But over here, we have this very simple little uh, bouquet of plastic flowers. This is a representation of a different supper. This supper is called the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Okay, Now you read about this in the book of Revelation. So table one. Last Supper. Table two, Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Now, before we go any further, is anybody confused with the term supper? Like, at, when you eat at 6 o'clock, what do you call it? <laughs> Some of you are saying, just an appetizer. Uh, the <laughs> so I grew up in northern Minnesota in the farmland. You know, everybody knew everybody, and, and it was just great. And it was supper. And so we had, we had breakfast. And then oftentimes brunch too. And then at lunch, the noontime, we had dinner. And then evening was supper. And, and so it's different in different parts of the world. So supper was the evening meal. And you know what? Here's what I remember about supper. I remember I had to be home for supper. So as a kid growing up, we lived in an area that had a number of houses, maybe 200 houses and then a vacant lot. And every, all the kids in the neighborhood would go to the vacant lot right after school if they didn't have other things going on. Or on Saturdays, right? And the vacant lot is where you played games, right? Does anybody else have this in their background? And so you know what we called the vacant lot? 
the vacant lot. And so we'd say, Make, meet at the vacant lot. And we'd play all sorts of games like hot box, which is a baseball game. We'd play uh, these very intellectual games like throwing the ball up. And if you catch it, everybody tackles you. Like, you know, just like brutal stuff. And so the rule was, though, when you're there, is you had to be home for supper. And I remember my mom worked really hard, my dad worked really hard, and they kind of instilled that you want to be home and respect people when they're cooking. I don't know if you've ever cooked, made a real good meal, and then someone's super late or doesn't show up. Doesn't that feel awesome? And so, <laughs> sorry, a lot of you are convicted right now, sorry. No, I'm not. So, let's, uh, we have the supper, and what, why I'm telling you this is, I remember guys coming home as a kid, and I would open the door, and I'd walk in, and I would smell what was cooking. Yeah, oftentimes it was like a pot roast with potatoes in a crock pot, those little carrots, some onions. I know you're getting hungry. And you walked in and it just, the smell of it just made me relax. Like, yeah. Then my mom would usually say, wash up for dinner, you know, because it wasn't a ceremonial cleansing. I was just always really dirty. And so I come in and then you sit down at the table. And for me, I was really blessed. Not everybody had this, but I had a mom and I had a dad and I had a brother and a sister and an annoying dog. And when we sat down for supper, and this was just a routine, it gave me this incredible sense of warmth, safety, love, it was something I could count on. There was provision. Like, I didn't realize it then, but I realize now in this crazy, hectic, busy world of oftentimes not being able to gather for, for supper, that it was this just feeling where I felt the presence of God through loving family. And I thought about that as we're about to talk about communion and, and take communion together. You see, I was called home for supper. And that sweet aroma is like the sweet aroma of Christ. And I, I think, guys, for you showing up today at 11 o'clock on a Sunday that's gorgeous outside, I think some of you are being called home to supper. Some of you, the Lord is saying, you've kind of been doing a bunch of things that maybe aren't the priority for me in your life and I'm calling you home for supper. I just want you to know it's really good. Okay? So we have the Last Supper. What was this one called again? Last Supper. We have, what was this one called again? Marriage Supper of the Lamb. Did I tell you where this came from yet? I can't remember. So this Marriage Supper of the Lamb is fantastic. It came from John, who wrote part of the Bible. John was talking about Jesus a lot. So back in the day, uh, they tried to stop him. And tradition says, not the Bible, but tradition in the faith movement says, they tried to kill John to stop him from talking about Jesus, right? The people that didn't, didn't, weren't into the Jesus thing. And they tried all sorts of things, including, I don't know if you heard this before, but boiling him in a pot of water to kill him. And he wouldn't die. And so they couldn't kill him, so what they did is they said, we're going to exile you to an island called Patmos. It's just off of Turkey right now. And we're going to put you in a cave to shut you up. And then the Lord visits him through an angel and gives him a revelation or an apocalyptic idea of what future warnings and what future blessings are going to be. And he writes all of these down, and, and they tried to shut him up. But in reality, the whole world has read his words in the book of Revelation. Right? You, you just, you cannot stop the kingdom of God. Right? And his love. And so he writes, and one of the things he gets is a vision of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's what's before all of us who have repented and believed in Jesus. Right? And this marriage supper of a Lamb is epic. I'm going to tell you about it after we take communion. But it is more than, more than just a meal. Some people take that Bible literally. It is literally a figurative or language about a prophetic illustration. And so I'm going to explain that a little bit because it's so much better. It's so much better than just a meal. Okay? So that's coming. Let's go back over here. What's this one called again? Okay. We're going to take communion today in our awesome little plastic things, right? And we're going to do this in a moment. So hang on to these and it'll be real clear when we do it together. As a family, we're actually going to have Tim come up and sing a song for us before we take it. So we're just, we're taking our time today to breathe in this moment of communion today. 
All right? Now, I wanted to remind you what happened at this Last Supper. Because when you think about the Last Supper, you usually think about wine and bread, right? Those are two very good things, unless you're on like a low-carb diet and stuff. But it's still very good things. But you see, at one point, Jesus is going to say, remember me when you do this. He's not saying, just remember the cross. So we're supposed to remember when we take communion a variety of things. So what I want to do is just real quick give you a highlight film of what happened at this Last Supper. It's amazing because people don't realize, according to John, what happened at this Last Supper. You guys have had some good suppers. But this supper, best supper ever until that one. No. So I'm going to read some scriptures. When I read the scripture, then I want you to just say amen, like so be it in the depths of our gut. That's what amen means, okay? Before I do that, one thing. When someone's having a last supper, what they say, which we have recorded in the Bible in John 14, 15, 16, and 17, is usually pretty important. Jesus knew this was going to be his last words with his family of disciples. And so we have to look at this like, snap, this is important. I remember, you guys, when my wife's dad was dying, Bill, and we were in the hospital with him, and we knew he was dying from Parkinson's. Really, really a courageous man. And there was this moment where I showed up. I've shared this with some of you who heard this, but I showed up in the morning one Saturday, and he had lost the ability to speak, but he was still alive and could kind of communicate. And he knew, because we talked, I said, Bill, this is it, man. If there's anything you want me to know, and here's what I want you to know. And I told him how much I loved him. What a great dad he was. He provided this woman that I got to marry. What a gift. And that's when he held up. He couldn't speak, but he held up two fingers. And one, he, I could tell he was talking about Julia. And her brother, Todd, was the other one. And he just looked me in the eyes and he said, like this. And in his way, he was saying, because they didn't have a relationship, that was awesome. He was saying to me on his deathbed, would you do what you can to help reconcile a relationship between my two kids? You see, it was so important to him. So Jesus does some things here that us as kids, he really wants us to know. Let me give you a couple highlights. Number one, this is the meal, according to John, where Jesus flips what leadership really is. And he's talked about earlier that the the Gentile leaders kind of use authority and rule over people. But then he says, not so with you guys. And he demonstrated it. He says, at the Last Supper, he rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. The disciples would have been freaking out like, no, 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 no. We're supposed to wash your feet. This isn't how it works. Later he says, if I then, the Lord, the teacher, have washed your feet, you also wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should just or should do just as I have done to you. This last supper is where the disciples' feet were washed by the king. The king gets down on his knees, gets dirty, gets all up in their toes, takes out things between toes, washes their feet to say, there is a new way. There is a new kingdom. There is a new worldview. There's a whole new way to operate. Jesus, period, means we don't rule, we serve. Can I get an amen? So, later, there's this, here's the highlight film, like you're watching a, a game or something from the past, and just the highlights. This is the supper where Jesus says this, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there's many rooms. This is the supper where Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the table, oh yeah, you can say amen to that. Okay, (laughs) I forgot. This is the table where he says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Amen, isn't that good? This is the the, the, uh, supper where he said, abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, I will abide in him. This, oh yeah, go ahead. Amen. Uh, This is the supper where he says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have 
peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Amen, right? It gets even better. You see, this is where he gives a new commandment. Let me read it. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. You guys, here's the context of this. There were 10 great commandments that most of us know, right? Honor your father and mother, blah, 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 right? I'm not saying blah, blah, blah to discredit them. I just don't have the time and I can't remember. So they have those ones. And then on top of or including that, there were 613 laws that you had to keep in the Old Testament. Jesus shows up and says, ta-da, I have fulfilled all 613, and I've shrunk it down to two. <laughs> I love this, because Jesus knows I'm Norwegian. I'm just not that bright. And he says, 613, now I'm just giving you two. And Jesus says, before the Last Supper, he says, love God with everything you have, right? And then the second one he says is, love others. Now, the others isn't the followers of Jesus. In that context, the others is people that don't follow Jesus. He's saying, love the other people that aren't part of the kingdom. Love them into the kingdom. That's why I'm so excited for Easter, because every Easter people come into the kingdom if we invite them. So we got those two communion, or commandments at communion. Jesus, the most important supper, his last supper, says, hey, guys and gals. One more commandment. Like this would have been a pretty big deal. And he says to him, love each other. Love God. Love those who don't follow me. But make sure you love each other. And this is how they will know that you are one of my disciples. This is, of all the three, this might be the one that the church has the most opportunity to improve. You see, we get kind of sidetracked with, this is how things are, and this is the way that the church should be, and this is our denomination, and they're not doing it right. That's not love. We have people that are a brother and sister of yours, and you're holding a grudge, or I'm holding a grudge, or bitterness against them, but they're a brother and sister in the family. That's not love. Forgiveness. And grace, honest conversation, love, Canyon View, love each other. I can tell you, Julie and I have felt so much love in this last year, a lot of love. This is a loving church. But when we look at the church as on the planet, the, the global church, this is an area we got room to move, right? Let's love each other well. It came at the Last Supper. Hey, I put a hole in my pants when I got down on my knees just there. That's love. So uh, I was like, what? That feels funny. Um, so you guys, let's go back to the important thing that happened here, and then we're going to take communion together. Jesus said at one point, and he said, earnestly I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. Now, hold on. We're going to do it later together. I'm just reading it. He said, he took a cup. Um, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this, divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, why am I spending so much time at this Last Supper? Because, guys, it doesn't say do this to remember the cross. It says do this to remember me. Which, the apex of his life, is the cross and resurrection and his body and blood for us. But when we take communion, we remember what he did, but also who he is. He's the provider of that supper, too. And it goes on to say, like, uh, and likewise, he took a cup. This cup is poured out for you. Is the new covenant of my blood. 
what did he just do? He gave him a new commandment, but now he just said a new covenant. There's a new promise that is secure, and that is no longer the old ritual sacrificial system, but now I am the final lamb. I'm the final sacrifice. There's a new covenant. If you choose to repent and realize you've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, then, and believe in Christ and his resurrection, the covenant or the contract is that you will have life and have it forever. The new covenant. Could you imagine you guys being at that supper? Well, Jesus is with us in this supper right now. The Bible's very, very, very clear that Jesus as God has this opportunity to be everywhere and to be with you and to speak to you and your neighbor at the same time. It's beyond our understanding, as Scripture says, some things will be. But Jesus is here. And so, Jesus, we welcome you. We welcome you. So go ahead and just hold this in your hand for now. Just hold on to it. We're going to take it. And if anybody didn't get one, it's a, how we have the little cellophane on top, then more cellophane. You can just hold it. You don't have to open it yet if you don't want to. But hold your hand up if you didn't get one. And these ushers are awesome. They'll come and they'll hand one. They're nicer than me. I'd throw it at you. They'll hand it to you. <laughs> and what we're going to do, guys, is we're just going to take some time. And Tim's going to come up. And Tim has written this song with some friends. You've probably never heard it before. It's, it's brand new to reflect on what Jesus did do on the cross, his resurrection, and the mercy we find in him. After he's done with the song, he's just going to strum a little bit. That's your time between you and God just to talk to him. Life's so busy, so loud. We just need to have some moments where it's quiet. And in that time, here's what I would suggest. I would suggest that you confess any sin. Just confess it to him. I would ask that you consider forgiving people that have wronged you. Do you have any relationships in your life that just aren't going so great? Before you take communion, this is where you forgive and you bless them and you pray for them. And then the third thing after that is just thank God for all that he's done for you. That's what we're going to do in the next five minutes, the song and some time. And then I'll come back out and we'll take communion as a family. Thanks, Tim. on your brow beaten and bruised and raw I gazed into your eyes as I laid by your side knowing your cross was mine Lord have mercy mercy all that I thief on a cross caught in your love three simple words is all that I heard one final breath for you died such beauty and love had a rest in my heart me you gave your
at this moment, for many of the disciples, the penny would have dropped. They would have had a moment where they realized that there was something very difficult Jesus said days before, but now it makes sense. In fact, something Jesus said about bread and wine and body and blood caused many people to stop following him because they couldn't understand the hyperbole, the exaggeration for, att- for, for attention that he used. And yet, see, there's always, if it's not understandable, it always comes to a moment of realization. That's true with our lives, guys. And so at this moment, the disciples seeing him breaking bread and handing off the wine would have remembered this. In John 6, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Later, he says, whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. You see, they didn't get it then. Many people turned away. And it was leading to this moment that we are to consume Christ in our life. And so we remember him today. That evening he took bread and he broke it after giving thanks. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. So as a family, let's remember, take the bread. In a similar fashion, he took a cup and he said, this is the blood of a new covenant that is shed for you for the forgiveness of all sin, all sin, everything you've ever done, thought, considered, forgiven. May we remember that as it trickles down our throat. We remember. Yeah. We remember. We remember. Ah, the glorious sound of of plastic coming off the cups. The holy moment. So Holy Spirit come remind us consistently of this. And all God's people said, will you thank Tim for uh, sharing that song with us? So before we go, we have the Last Supper, table one, and the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, table two. Let me just tell you quickly about this guy over here, because it's awesome. The marriage supper of the Lamb is actually recorded in the book of Revelation. I'll read it in a moment. But to fully understand it, I want to give you the context of marriage that John would have understood and that Jesus would have understood just real quickly. Some of you know, some of you don't know how marriage worked back then. Here's what happens. There's a girl and there's a guy. (laughs) Okay? And they have parents. Those parents would sign a contract that these two are to get married, and then the kids would sign the contract. I would guess at times the kids wanted that, and at times they maybe didn't, and they grew to love each other or something, right? So it was this kind of marriage contract or covenant. In that covenant, on phase one, there's a part where you have to give a dowry or a payment. The groom gives a payment to the to the family or the bride, uh, for marrying her. And so right now, guys, don't start calculating how much your wife is worth. Don't go there uh, because she's priceless. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay, just to help you out. So in that, that some people think that the illustration is that the covenant of the marriage is the covenant of the new, new covenant with Christ with us, and the dowry paid is Christ's payment of his life so that we could be with him. So that's phase one. Phase two is really fun. Phase two is the torch 
parade or the torchlight parade. And the groom would get torches with his homies and the men would go at midnight to the bride's house and gather her up after he's created a place for her, right? And so they knew it was happening. It wasn't like a big surprise, right, in this case. And so they would gather up the, the, the bride and family and her friends, and it was a midnight party with fire. This sounds awesome to me anyways. And so then they go back. That's phase two, the torchlight parade. So fun. Many people think we are in the torchlight parade right now. I'll explain that uh, uh, prophetically. I'll explain that in a moment. And then three. Phase three is the marriage supper. In the marriage supper, there would be a little probably ceremony, and then the best would come out, the best food they could do, the best wine they could do. Now, it's, what's interesting is this wouldn't last just one day. You know, we go to, what do we do? We go to a wedding maybe, then we have a little wedding dance, we dance poorly, and then we go home, right? It's usually a day, a couple hours. This, minimum seven days, a seven-day party of the best provision and food and wine. And the miracle, the first one Jesus does, it's at this party a couple days in probably and they run out of wine, which would totally dishonor the bride's parents big time. And so what does he do? Usually they bring out the bad stuff once everybody's kind of happy and, and they don't know. He makes wine and they bring it out. It's the best wine they've ever tasted and they just can't believe it. That's his first miracle at a marriage supper, right? And so what the marriage supper of the Lamb is, is this we're thankful for. This we have to look forward to. It is more than just a meal. It will include good food. But it's saying that for all time, when Christ makes a new heaven and a new earth, that now the eternity is the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's the consistent provision and food and joy and love and celebration and dancing. All of our eternity is this marriage supper idea. Now we get this in the book of Revelation, which is so cool. I'll read it quick. Then I heard, this is John, what seemed to be a voice of a great multitude. Oh, like a roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder. Peals of thunder. Hallelujah, it says. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen and bright and pure, for the fine linen is representative of righteous deeds of the saints. Then the angel said to me, this is John, write this. If an angel tells you to write something down, it's real important. And so here's what he says. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then he said to me, these are the true words of God. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. See, many of you in this room have been invited, and you've received the invitation. You've repented, and you believe in this Jesus, and you're following him. Not perfect, nobody is. And this is what's before you. You know, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, is there cancer? No. At the marriage supper of the Lamb, is there pain? Is there suffering? No. Is there it kind of inadequacy? No. Over here, all things are made new. All pain is gone. There is no longer sin. All relationships restored. It is a bath of love. For all eternity. That's a good supper. So we as followers, or those even who are exploring your faith right now, we live between the two tables. You see, that's the marriage supper. This also shows us the phase one of the marriage has happened. And right now, I think it's the marriage, it's the uh, torchlight parade that the groom, this is representative of Jesus, is gathering his church. He's gathering his church. He's gathering his church. And he's gathering his church, people who are very far from him because he's all about love. And he's gathering his church through all types of ways, sometimes supernatural, but most of the time through 
you. <laughs> you are a torch. Have you heard this be the light thing before? And you are part of God's grand plan to gather so that more, the people that God loves, who is everybody, can enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. You wonder why we get so excited about Easter. It's because that's when so many people accept the invitation. Because of your invitation. <laughs> it's just beautiful. So how do we live in this ta table one, table two? Communion. Talk about communion. Communal living here. Oh my gosh, it's going to be amazing. So how do we live in between? Here's the real short of it. We have a lifestyle of communion. See, communion isn't meant only to be a five-minute thing in a church gathering with our fellow believers. It's meant to be a lifestyle. Briefly, it's two things. Communion as a lifestyle means a pursuit of intimacy with Jesus himself for the rest of our lives. Intimacy with Jesus. Not just knowing the good book, and it's a good book. All right? But in the book actually says that the word of God is actually Jesus. Jesus' nickname is the word of God. And so what we're doing is pursuing Jesus, period. We are pursuing him and intimacy with him. If you don't have intimacy with Jesus, the church and your family is here to help that we can all go on that journey together. Guys, you know me. For many years before, my journey was intimacy with money or sex or kind of a quick adrenaline rush. And then later in life, I discovered this passionate pursuit Jesus had of me and my family. And I've just been on this journey of intimacy. Remembering what he did, but expecting what's coming. And I just, just to be honest, if you're here searching or never been to church before, there's just nothing better. The peace that's come in our life through cancer and other things. I mean, just this week, Julia had a lump in her breast and the mammogram didn't look good. And so we had to go down and get the second results on Friday, I think it was. And there was no concern in our hearts or minds. Now, it's not because of us. I'm a moron, capital M. <laughs> but it's because of this lifestyle of intimacy with Christ first that it's just in me, the Holy Spirit, to know that this is going to be fine. This will be fine. Either she's going to be healed or nothing's there, or if something's there, it'll be fine. God's got this. And so we're going down to this second thing, and we're both full of joy, and it's like, hey, we're going on a boob check date. This is awesome. <laughs> like, that's actually what I said. I'm just a very transparent person. It, we, we thought, like, hey, we get time together in the car. We get to sit. We don't have a lot of time together sometimes, and it's like a date. Now, how would that happen if it wasn't for, honestly, it's nothing to do with us? It's simply the love of Christ inside us, giving us peace. So intimacy with Christ. Second is intimacy or communion with each other. Over COVID, we have seen and sociologists have told us that anxiety and stress and worry have all gone up. Loneliness, depression has gone down. I've gone to Mind Springs with a young adult who was about to cut their wrists, who just couldn't handle it anymore months ago. This stuff's real. Loneliness is a big deal right now. And so as a church living in between the tables, we actually are called to live in community and not be isolated. Now, I know some of you don't like people. I get it. Some people are really, really bad. And they've hurt you. But this is an invitation to come home for supper. It's to be with people. If you organically have friends, then you be the leader and you invite them to meet once a month maybe or once a week or whatever works and just talk about Jesus and maybe, maybe just say, what do you need for prayer today? Just organically do it. Yeah, be with people. We're designed to be in community. And I know everybody's so busy. And if you don't know where to start, this is why life groups, when you hear Pastor Kirk and others talk about life groups, it's not just some little thing that we think is cool and you're supposed to do at church. It's life or death for some people. And we can actually plug you into a group that's already meeting. And they'll be kind to you. And they'll love you. And if you go to a group, a life group, and they're not your cup of tea, then these people are weird, or there's just not chemistry, okay, great. 
No need to get your undies in a bunch. It's okay. What we can do then is let's just try another one. And maybe there will be chemistry. Not a big deal. Won't offend anybody. There's almost no lose. So we live intimacy with Christ. We have communion with each other. And then as a church, we worship and celebrate God. That's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle of communion. Love you guys. What you need to know today is that Jesus Christ gave his body and blood so that he could have like forever with you because you're so precious to him. So why don't we stand and uh, we'll sing before we go. You see, at this table, there's one more thing they did before they went to the garden, before uh, he, Jesus got arrested, before, you know, Jesus washed the feet of Judas and he knew Judas was going to betray him. Isn't that interesting? Jesus loved on the person that betrayed him. Someone need to hear that today. That just popped in my head. If there's somebody that's being betrayed or you feel someone's against you, you might need a good boundary because that person's toxic, but love them. And you have to figure out what that looks like. Forgive them. But at the table at the Last Supper, the last thing they did before they went to the garden, the last thing Jesus did with his friends as a group before his um, resurrection was a song. They sang, and then they went to the garden. So we're going to sing, and then we're going to go home. So Holy Spirit, come and speak to us as we worship you through this song. Thank you, Tim.
You guys, I know that life between the tables, because the kingdom has come and yet there's more to come, this already not yet, sometimes it's not the easiest place to live. But I think it's the best time in history to live because we have what he has done and we can share that and invite people into what we have before us. What a privilege that we were born in this season of life. What a gift. And so may the Lord bless you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you grace and favor. And all God's people said, amen. Ministry team, if you'd be available, these guys are here to pray for you. If you're waiting for a result on a medical thing or have any any issue in life you'd like some prayer for, any of these folks that are up here are a safe person to receive prayer. Next week is going to be a party. Uh, and so we will see you next week for the party. And uh, God bless you guys. Have a great day.